Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all that you are, who that you are, and all that you've done in our lives. I ask your continued blessings upon these studies here in the Gospel of John. We are keenly aware of just how little we know and how infinite your word is. I ask that you would just filter out all of the error but seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the Gospel of John. And in our last study together, we were looking at the area from uh, about around verses 11 through 14 of chapter 1. Christ is the manifestation of God. In the beginning was the Word, but the Word was made flesh. He, he became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. You're looking at the profound truth that our relationship to God is based upon His activity, not ours. And that runs contrary to much of modern thought. John bore witness of Him and cried, saying, This is He of whom I spoke. He that cometh after me is more excellent than me, is preferred before me, for He was before me. Obviously, some critics have argued that there's no way that John the Baptist could understand that Jesus Christ was God incarnate in human flesh, but he did. He knew that Christ was the forerunner, or that he knew that he was the forerunner of Christ, the Messiah. He also knew that the Messiah was very excellent. He was uh, the promised branch, and of his fullness have all we received in grace for grace. If you have the authorized version, you'll read grace for grace. And so that's going to occupy our attention, uh, much of our attention in this video. And that there isn't any way that I can really do justice to the depth of that one simple statement, grace upon grace or grace for grace, but, but I'll try. It's so wonderful to realize that we are in Christ, in Christ. One of Paul's favorite phrases, in Christ. We're not, uh, we don't operate, we don't exist as, uh, as believers outside of, of Christ, as if we're separate and apart from Christ. We are in Christ, and the depth of that statement has tremendous, has profoundly uh, deep theological meaning. If the root is holy, so are the branches, and we're told that we are the branch. So our holiness, if you, if you want to use that word, uh, is not based upon us, but upon the root, the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that you hold dear in your, uh, uh, what word should I use, religion, I prefer the word uh, theology, is going to depend upon who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ did. First of all, the word fullness. The first place that that word ever occurs in the New Testament, and, and it's always interesting to see where the Holy Spirit first uses a word. And this is used in Matthew of the putting new cloth in an old garment to repair or, or to fill up the old garment. And it won't wear. Can't put new cloth in an old garment. It'll just tear. It'll tear because the new is strong and the old is weak. And it's used there to fill up. We all know that in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we have received grace for grace. Now the word for there. Uh, F-O-R there, is anti in the Greek, you know, like, uh, or anti, 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 like antichrist. And there are those who argue that antichrist means against Christ. Normally, this Greek word doesn't mean against. It normally means in place of or instead of. And if that's the meaning that we put on it here, then it would 
read grace instead of grace, grace in place of grace, and that doesn't seem to work. At least, well, at least not for me. Some Greek scholars have argued that there are occasions where the Greek word anti can be translated upon, and so they would then say that this is grace upon grace. Many of the translations will, will present it that way. And from, so from those two possible translations, uh, several possibilities emerge. One is that the grace in place of grace is the new covenant versus the old covenant. Or, or maybe we ought to say grace in place of grace is Old Testament versus New Testament. That's one popular approach to the verse. We're no longer under law, we're under grace. However, uh, what law did was highlight grace. I tend to think that if, there'd be, if I had been Moses, the first thing that I'd have said to God, probably said to God, when God handed me the tablets of stone, you know, would have been, Lord, nobody can do this. Uh, it's not an inference of free will. It, it's, a, it, it's an inference of total depravity. That's what it is. I can't do it. And Lord, if I can't do it, I can't take it down to your people. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. It wasn't given, it came. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law highlighted man's total depravity, his total, absolute inability to meet the claims of God's righteousness. So it's difficult to say that grace in place of grace means law, grace in place of law. I don't think law was ever grace. Grace is all throughout the Old Testament. It was a a gracious God that provided for His people when they complained. It was a gracious God who gave them food when they were blaspheming Him. It was a gracious God who didn't, who didn't wipe them off the face of the earth for their disobedience and for their sin. The law was the background upon which the grace of God was highlighted. It was also the background upon which the total depravity of man was highlighted. So it's difficult for me to accept that grace in place of grace means our New Testament grace in place of Old Testament law. Now some Greek scholars argue that uh, anti can be translated upon, grace upon grace. And I'm going to tell you what I think, and, and of course, you know, what I think is correct. I hope some of you laughed at that. Let's think about grace upon grace. It seems to me that if that's the position that we take, we have a stronger bibli biblical base. In Acts 18, we're told that we believe by grace. In Romans 11, 5, we're told that we were elected by grace. In Acts 15, 11, in Ephesians 2, 8, we're told that we're saved by grace. In Romans 3, 4, we're told that we're justified by grace. In Romans 4, 6, we're told that our future is absolutely certain by grace, not by works, that we've received gifts from God by grace. Romans 12, 6, that we're a partaker, partaker of the body of Christ by grace. 1 Corinthians 10, that our way of life is by grace, our manner of life is by grace. 2 Corinthians 1, that we have been given the riches of God by grace. 2 Corinthians chap chapter 8, verse 9, that our all-sufficiency is by grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, that we are accepted in the Beloved. Ephesians 1, 7, by grace we have everlasting consolation and that we have good hope by grace. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 16, that we have God's help by grace and Hebrews 4.16, that we are granted the privilege of service by grace. Hebrews 12.28, that we are established in eternity, or we are established eternally by grace. Hebrews 13.9. Well, there's just a few cases. Surely it looks like God 
has showered upon us grace upon grace. It almost looks as though the Holy Spirit is describing all grace received, grace upon grace. All that we believe is based upon the grace of God, everything. Therefore, I tend to lean strongly in that direction as far as an interpretation of, of this verse goes. But is that the thought that the Holy Spirit intended to convey here? Is the question, Grace insists that it is totally independent of our performance, of our belief, of our conviction, of our acceptance, of our repentance, or anything else. You stand before God, righteous, because of the grace of God and the finished work of Jesus Christ. In verse 16, we read, Of His fullness we have all received. There, so there appears to be two aspects of grace in Romans chapter 11. If, we turn to, to, if you look at Romans chapter 11, just a cursory reading of Romans chapter 11. I won't have you turn there. But there appears to be two aspects of grace. One aspect of grace was clearly that the grace of God was operating in the setting aside of Israel so that the fullness of the Gentiles might come in. That's a wonderful thing. That's absolutely a wonderful thing to think that their being set aside brought in the fullness of the Gentiles. But the text goes on and says, if you think that's wonderful, what do you think their, their fullness will be. God calls it grace when He elects, so I have to stop and think about that for a moment. Elijah, he came and said, I'm the only one. And God says, I've reserved 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Now when we get into Romans 11, the Holy Spirit begins to tell us about this experience and says, that by the election of grace he had reserved 7,000. So now, now let me ask you, can he redeem by election? The fact that he elected by grace is a wonderful thing. And, you know, many Christians don't believe that, but I'm speaking to, to those of you who do. Election, being chosen in him before the foundation of the, of the world. That, that is a marvelous, marvelous truth. But, it is insufficient. There has to be yet another aspect of grace that included the incarnation, our kinsman redeemer, the shedding of blood, the substitutionary sacrifice, the death, burial, resurrection of our Lord. Election is one thing. Being chosen is one thing. Christ's perfect finished work on the cross is another. Grace upon grace. Perhaps this is what the text is saying. I believe without question, election reveals grace. Why should God elect? And, and, and I fear that many, many Christians seem to get the idea that God Almighty is looking. He, what He's doing is He's looking out over the human race down through time uh, and, and on through time. And, and He's saying, well... You know, this person, he's not, he's not too bad, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elect him. I don't like the looks of that other guy, so I won't elect him. And somehow, that election is, is not based on grace. It's either based on, on looks, family, race, production, performance, willingness. I, I don't know. But the average Christian that I talk to believes that God's election was somehow based on something in them, in us, that propelled God to say, I'll elect him and not somebody else. Failing to recognize that we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And so they'll say, well, God looked ahead and he saw how that I would be, so he elected me. So living outside of time, he already saw what I was going to do. He already saw what you and I were going to do. And already seeing what we were going to do, he then, based upon that, he elected us. And that all sounds good, but what it does 
is it destroys grace. Grace is no longer grace. If God's election depended in any way on anything that you did, it's not grace. It's reward. So the fact that God chose you had absolutely nothing to do with what you did. If there's, if there's any other basis for that election, it's works. But it's grace. Yet election is not enough. The election was, was, was grace, and I believe the, the vicarious substitutionary death of our Lord Jesus Christ in our place was grace, and it took both for me to be a child of God. Yet as wonderful a solution as that seems to be as far as my understanding of this verse, I feel I've got to reject it. Since in my mind, what that does is that limits the expression grace upon grace to just those two things. Election and redemption. Therefore, it does seem as though the Holy Spirit is describing here in verse 16 all the grace that we've received. And I base that on the word fullness that I see in the text. And of His fullness have, we, have all we received and grace for grace. We are complete in Him. We know that. The word fullness is a word, uh, pleroma, meaning fullness, a filling up, fulfillment, completion, the sum total, superabundance. That's what the word means. The grace of God is the very basis of our relationship to Him, our election, redemption, service, our confidence, our, our hope, our deliverance, our righteousness, and that all, all of that speaks of the finished work of Christ. We've been made righteous in Christ. We have peace with God. If you don't have peace with God, you don't understand what Jesus Christ has done for you. If you don't have peace with God, you are still under the conviction that somehow your performance has something to do with your sonship. Rather than make this complicated, I believe that the Holy Spirit is using the simplest possible words to open our hearts and minds to the deepest theological truth that every aspect, every single jot and tittle of our, of our past and, and future, past, present, and future, is governed by His never-ending grace. We have received completeness. That's, that's why the Holy Spirit can say in Colossians, we are complete in Him. It's the same word, or the same root. If you're complete in Him, what more do you need? You've completely received of His fullness so that you are complete in Him. You have received grace upon grace. Now, I did consider the fact that it could be that what the verse is talking about is what I've, I've mentioned, pointed out previously uh, in, in videos, the twofold aspect of God removing Adam's transgression, behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world, then removing our sin, our sin. If uh, you're unfamiliar with that uh, discussion, you might want to look back on one of my previous videos. I'm not going to, don't, I don't have time to go over that again here, but I believe we're looking at the grace that as his child, I'm a branch from the root. Verse 16 isn't possible without verse 14. Had he not been made flesh and tabernacled among us, his glory, grace, and truth, and, and the grace I wanted you to see is that God has chosen you and carried through on that choice with all the rest. Verse 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Oh, what a verse that is. You know, I, you could, a person could spend days on that verse, weeks, months, on that just that one, that one simple statement. 
The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law was to first show God's righteousness, but and that and that man couldn't keep it. It was it was given, but grace and truth was not given. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, and I believe that distinction is important to, to take note of. Unlike the law which was given, grace which came is not something that you can take or leave. Can't take it or leave it. Like well, like much of what popular Christianity today believes. They believe that, that God's grace is resistible. The Bible in nowhere suggests that God's grace is something that can be resisted. The very nature of grace itself is that God does something to you without condition. It, it, it destroys the very definition of the word grace to suggest that grace is resistible. Grace is not resistible. Grace is irresistible. Grace and truth came, and for the first time in the Gospel of John, we're given His full name, Jesus Christ. Folks, God never anticipated man keeping the law. Remember, if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. God had our redemption all worked out before Adam was ever created and placed in the garden. No way could God have said the law came by Moses, but He could say the law was given by Moses. Here are two nouns with definite articles separated by a conjunction. The grace and, there's the conjunction, the truth. The grace and the truth. They are inseparable from Jesus Christ. There isn't any synergism in grace, and yet modern theology wants you to believe that there is. Nor is there any synergism in truth. We have nothing to do with fulfilling grace, meeting the demands of grace, accepting grace, rejecting grace. You don't have anything to do with making truth. It came. It wasn't offered. It wasn't suggested. It's an aorist tense, not to be repeated. It came by means of Jesus Christ. There was no other means. You've got to sense the anguish almost and the emotion of God in the expression. If there had been a law given which could have given life, if there could have been a way, He wouldn't have had to send His Son to die in our place. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. God has gone out of His way to make us see once again that Jesus of Nazareth is God Almighty. And I spent some time on the word only begotten pointing out Isaac, uh, Isaac being Abraham's only begotten, when we know that Abraham had four to five other kids, at least. Five if we include Ishmael. The word means one who is dearly beloved, highly special. One God in three persons speaks of position and how God chooses to reveal Himself to us. He's one God who reveals Himself in the aspect of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Our Lord said, If you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. Well, that appears on the surface to be a contradiction. It's really not. I believe this to be saying, no man can know God unless Jesus Christ reveals Him. 
God isn't revealed to all men, but only to those whom God decides or wills to reveal Him. And that theme will be developed later on in John. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and, and Levites from Jerusalem to ask Him, Who art thou? The uh, is there in that verse, the is, is a present tense. This continues to be the record of, record of John. Continues to be the record of John. Here we have time coming into the verse. It has always been, continues to be, the record of John. Now i got to be careful here. I, I don't know what John's... I have no idea what John's life was like. Don't know, don't know what he looked at, dreamed about, what he did in his off hours. You know, where does your mind snap when you don't have anything else to do? I don't know how John lived his life. John didn't have an easy life. We know he didn't have a, a very easy life. He didn't have the best of di best diet. Locusts and wild honey, you know, some twist the Hebrew word locust around to make it sound something like a heath bar. I think the, the best study that can be done on that word is he ate locusts. And he was finally beheaded. Not, not, the, not exactly the neatest way to die. And get this, and, and that by stepping outside the boundaries of his foreordained ministry, it was, behold, the Lamb of God, grace and truth. It was all about grace and truth. Then he steps outside what God's, I believe, was God's intended ministry. And uh, if you read the account, you, most of you, some of you, I guess, know what happened. He felt he had to confront Herod over his marriage. And he wound up losing his head over it. Quite a jump from law, you know, from from grace and truth to now, you know, with Herod, law. And it cost him his head. Now, just as a side note, I believe that there is a, there's some shadow connection there with that uh, to those beheaded in Revelation, but I've yet to really put my finger on it. Because in both instances, the coming Messiah and the kingdom are in focus. So I find that interesting. We have no indication that, that he ever went to Bible school. Prob probably went, to, you know, probably went to Moody, I don't know. But we have no indication that he was educated in any way in the, in the theological schools of Israel. And yet, the whole nation goes out to him and asks to be baptized. He's a no one. He, he arrives on the scene. He's John the Baptist, wild locusts and honey, living in, a, in the wilderness, wandering in the wilderness. And everyone goes out to him to be baptized. They didn't go to the chief priest to be baptized. God didn't choose the Sanhedrin for him to go to to be baptized. That's interesting. And that's, that's got to bother the Sanhedrin because folks, you know, I mean, listen, these, are, these were the experts, okay? I look at, at all the Sanhedrin did in the four Gospels, and I'm, a, I'm of the mind at least that the unanimous opinion of, of a board of experts is invariably wrong. So anyway, there, there's where we're at in our study to, uh, with, in John here. This is where I'm going to leave off until the next video, part six. I want to take a moment to thank all of you 
uh, just to say a few things about you who take the time to come here and listen. You're in my prayers constantly. 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 You're in my prayers. I appreciate your prayers, your concerns as well for this ministry. The plan is to stay the course for me to keep my hand to the plow despite the number of whether the views uh, increase or decrease, despite the declining, the present decline in views, the plan is to just stay the course. Because I appreciate every one of you. I, I see what how the Lord has, has worked in your life through the truth of, of His Word. And I, I can't be more thankful to God than I am for that. I, I simply love and appreciate and adore the fellowship, what fellowship that we do have. We're living in very precarious times. I thank God for this ministry and I thank God for you. That's just pretty much it uh, in a nutshell. It keeps us grounded, solid, it keeps our focus in the right direction of trusting in Him and not in ourselves during these last few final days before He returns for His church. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thank you for watching.